science is frankly a topic that probably deserves a video series all into its own. But since I want to focus primarily on the philosophy of science, I want to do a very, very, very brief overview of the history of science between antiquity and the 19th century. When I get to the body of videos that focus on the philosophy of science, I'll be focusing primarily on what happens in the 20th century. So this is to cover the 3,000 some odd years between then and now. Now for most of human history, Questions about the nature of reality, the universe, and the world were answered by religious authorities. If you wanted to know why the sky was blue, why the crops weren't uh, growing, why people die, and so forth, if you had these questions, you would go to a priest or a shaman. They were the only people who even pretended to have the answers. Now, even in religious cultures, there was the birth of some moves towards a more rationalistic approach. Mathematics was born in Egypt, the formal mathematics, that is, and the Babylonians later figured out how to apply that to astronomy, which is quite possibly the world's first science. But it really isn't until we get to the ancient Greek world that what, we can, what you can properly call sort of the beginnings of science, proto-science, if you will, starts to develop. Pre-Socratic philosophers, uh, uh, that is the philosophers in ancient Greece, were the first ones to try to develop a systematic understanding of the world based on observation and experience rather than on, simply on religious authority. The most important figure here is probably Thales of Miletus, who's, who has been dubbed the father of science. In the 7th century BC, he was the first person to posit non-supernatural explanations for events like earthquakes, lightning, and so forth. He was actually able to use the system he developed to do things like predict solar eclipses and droughts, and he was able to make himself a pretty hefty fortune doing so, impressing people, but also uh, through the use of very canny business deals. He also said that reality is fundamentally made up of water. Well, hey, like I guess you can't get everything right the first time around. So I want to go through a list of some of the other important pre-Socratic uh, philosophers here. Uh, Anaximander was the first person to theorize that life originally arose out of water and mud and that human beings were evolved from lower life forms. This is a speculation, of course, but it's a speculation which would be uh, vindicated over 2,000 years later by none other than Charles Darwin. Empedocles was the guy who actually discovered air using a straw and a glass of water, a trick that you guys have probably done many times before. You put your thumb on the top of the straw and you pull it out and the water stays in the straw. Something's holding the water in. What is it? Air pressure. Who was the first person to discover that? Empedocles. Uh, in the words of Carl Sagan, Empedocles had discovered the invisible. Democritus is a guy, the guy who first speculated that matter was made up of small little things which he called atoms. Atom in Greek literally means uncuttable. And he thought that these small atoms composed everything in reality. He said nothing exists except atoms and the void. Now, today, of course, our concept of atoms is much, much more sophisticated than Democritus. And strictly speaking, what we call atoms are actually misnamed. Uh, what we call atoms are, are rather noticeably not uncuttable. We have nuclear power and nuclear weapons as a result of it. So if we were going to be a little bit more strict about our language, we probably shouldn't be calling atoms atoms. But, you know, I suppose maybe etymology isn't the only thing that we need to sacrifice for. Next up, Eratosthenes. This guy was so brilliant, he actually figured out a way to accurately measure the circumference of the Earth using just two sticks. Now think about that for a moment. If I gave you two sticks, you think you'd be able to measure the size of the Earth? I know I sure as hell couldn't, but this guy figured it out. How did he figure it out? Well, I'll give you a hint by showing you this illustration right here. Some basic trigonometry, measuring some distances, and measuring shadows, and well, he was able to figure it out within the range of, I think, about a couple of hundred miles, which is pretty impressive, really, when you think about the technology he was working with. Another important pre-Socratic figure is a gentleman by the name of Pythagoras. You probably all know him from his famous Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Everyone learns that in school. Pythagoras was one of the most brilliant mathematicians who ever lived. He actually was the first person to ever dub himself a philosopher. He said that he, uh, you know, one person accused him of being so wise in an arrogant fashion. Pythagoras' response was, well, I don't know if I'm wise, but I know that I love wisdom. So Pythagoras coined the term philosopher. He also started a school dedicated to mathematics and its application to nature. And sadly, it achieved kind of a cult-like status, and the people got so afraid of that cult that they actually stormed his house and burned him alive with several of his friends and a lot of his uh, mathematical discoveries in it. And to this day, we probably, there's probably lots of mathematical discoveries that, that died on that day that we still haven't rediscovered. 
Um, you also uh, might not know that Pythagoras actually was the first person to invent music theory. That's a story unto itself, which sadly I don't have time to tell today. Heraclitus and Parmenides. These, these were probably two of the most important pre-Socratic philosophers for, for, for the purposes of Plato and Plato's philosophy. They started major debates, which still goes on today in philosophy, um, and which we'll be talking about somewhat in this class. What exactly is it that justifies knowledge, for example? Is it reason or is experience? What's, what's the true foundation of knowledge? Um, what, what's the fundamental nature of nature? Is it, it, does it change eternally, or is there some sort of underlying permanence in nature that we can hold on to? Uh, these are huge and complex debates which, which deserve a lot more attention than I'm going to give them to here, but it's just worth mentioning these figures because they, they kickstart these huge debates in the philosophy of science. Heraclitus also, by the way, coined the phrase that titles this slide, nature loves to hide. What a brilliant expression for the enterprise of science. Nature loves to hide, and the job of science is to try and unveil her. Back in the days of the ancient Greeks, chemistry consisted of five basic elements, earth, air, fire, water, and ether. Now, when I tried to tell my high school chemistry teacher this, when he insisted on me trying to learn the periodic table of elements, uh, well, that, that didn't go over too well. It's not just uh, the, the, the physical sciences. Medicine also is, is developed in this time. Uh, two important figures are Hippocrates and Galen. They developed the first sort of scientific approach to anatomy and medicine. They used experiments. They used records to try and heal the sick. Rather than just using sort of shaman and magic and trying to propitiate the gods, they actually took, uh, took careful attention to what sorts of roots, what sorts of foods would help people recover faster, and what sorts of materials would, would, would uh, make them get sicker. And, you know, while it didn't exactly catch on for a very long time, it was the first attempt at, at, at scientific medicine. Now, after we get about 400 years into the Common Era, we start shifting out of the age of the ancient Greeks, and then, of course, later the, the Roman Empire, and we start shifting into the dawn of the Christian Empire and what's a period which comes to be known as the Middle Ages, or perhaps less flatteringly, the Dark Ages. Um, the Dark Ages gets its name, of course, as a contrast to the later period known as the Enlightenment. And it's not a terribly flattering image, but it's also one that's kind of frankly deserved. There were some advancements in European science at this, t at this time. Eyeglasses, for example, were invented after people figured out, after all that time making stained glass windows, how they could use it to correct vision so monks could read better. But other than I guess, these, these few developments here and there, science more or less ground to a halt. This graphic here gives you at least a, 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 a general sense of, of what it is that we're, we're, we're missing during this period. It's, it's a gross exaggeration, oversimplification, but it does at least sort of drive the point home. Where would we be today if we had kept moving forward with the Greek and Roman advancements in science uh, instead of that thousand plus year you know, limbo state that we entered into? It's a, kind of boggling when you, when you think about it that way. Now, during this period, the scientific advancements that were made in the world were done primarily in the Islamic world. Uh, during this 800-year stretch between 500 and 1300 of the Common Era, medicine, astronomy, and chemistry made huge advancements in, in parts of the world that were covered, that were ruled by Muslims. Uh, one figure I'll, I'll mention here, uh, a figure by the name of Ibn Rush, who's probably better known as his westernized slash Latinized name, Avicenna, who pioneered the techniques that led to the modern hospital. Now, the Dark Ages started to come to a halt in around the 12th century, thanks in large part to the birth of scholasticism. Scholasticism was an attempt to try to revive Greek thought and use it to support biblical dogma. The, the, the idea that the, the works of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, rather than being a threat to faith and a threat to religion, actually could help and enhance religion. That was one of the hallmarks of scholasticism. And that gradually, over a couple of hundred years, sort of started to bring an end to the Dark Ages, which leads us then into a period known as the Renaissance.